Hello all, it's just a quick video then to talk you through the coastal landscapes topic. This video is aimed at A-level geographers, so if you're currently studying GCSE, you'll need to leave this video and join the correct one. So if I'm thinking about key terminology to do with coastal landscapes, I suppose the first four words I think of are the four words you can see here. So I think about backshore, it's the area between high water mark and the landward limit, foreshore, the area between the high water mark and the low water mark, inshore between the low water mark and the point where the waves don't really have any influence, and offshore, so the point beyond where the waves cease to impact upon the seabed. And to put those into context, I can see them here. Again, just check you know the order they would come in. The sea would obviously be coming from this direction here as I'm looking at this diagram. I wouldn't worry too much about the other annotations here, but definitely the ones that I've put in red, just check you would know where they are roughly on a diagram. So I suppose the important thing to say next about coasts is you need to see coasts as a system. And within that system, we've got flows, so links between stores, we've got inputs, so the addition of matter into the system, and stores where we keep energy. Those four sources then, or inputs in the coastal environment, come in the form of wind and waves, but also sea currents and tides. And it's important to say that we could get one or more of these within our coastal system. So this impacts then on our waves. And I suppose wave movement at the beach is just something really useful to have in the back of your mind. We think first and foremost about friction within the seabed here is slowing down that wave. This crest of the wave is gonna to continue to move forward. We then get this elliptical orbit Think about a squashed circle. The wave continues to get steeper before it rushes up the beach as swash and returns back out to see them as backwash. And we have two different types of wave. We've got constructive waves. Think if you're constructing something, you're building something. These have got a low wave height, a low frequency. Again, very weak backwash, but strong swash. And then you've got your destructive waves. If you destruct something, you destroy. So these have got a higher wave height, a higher frequency, powerful backwash. And so this leads us nicely on to thinking about wave refraction. If we've got wave refraction, it means the waves are bending. Okay, and as it says here, waves refract towards shallower water. The quicker the change in water depth, the quicker the refraction. So typically at a curvy coastline, we get waves that are refracting on the headland, and therefore if I've got waves refracting on the headland, I'm gonna have high energy waves and increased erosion, and they refract out into the bay. So therefore that would give me low energy waves and increased deposition. Longshore drift, an important process of transportation. And again, just check you can explain this one. If I've got my prevailing wind approaching the beach at an angle, it's gonna push that wave up the beach at an angle. That sediment is then dragged back out to sea, picked up by the prevailing wind and the waves again, pushed back up the beach before it's then dragged back out to sea. So that zigzag movement of sediment is what we would call longshore drift. Rip currents is another key bit of terminology to use. These are just strong currents that move away from the shoreline, which is what this diagram here is showing you. I, to be honest, wouldn't want to be a swimmer or a small boat to be trapped in the middle here between these two rip currents would be extremely hazardous. So this links nicely then into thinking about tides. And quite simply, if I want to define what a tide is, I'm saying a tide is a periodic rise and fall of the level of the sea. I've got my two different types here, my spring tide and my neap tides. So spring tide is a tide just after new or full moon. A neap tide is a tide just after the first or third quarters of the moon. There's a difference between high and low water. Tidal range here is a difference between high and low tide. Again, just check you're familiar with this terminology at the bottom. So macro meaning large scale, micro meaning extremely small scale. And this leads us nicely on then to thinking about high energy and low energy coastlines. You'll see these phrases sort of banded around quite a bit within geography. If I'm thinking about a high energy coastline, I'm saying that the wave energy is high, erosion is likely to be greater. So as a result, I'm going to see headlands, cliffs, wave cut platforms. And perhaps my best example here is the Atlantic coastline of Northern Europe. 
If I compare that then to my low energy coastlines, wave energy is typically lower, deposition is normally a bit greater. I'd expect to see things like beaches and spits. So the Baltic Sea here would be my best example. So I've popped this in here just as a reminder that the specification says that you need to be familiar with all of these processes. So you've got your marine processes, including erosion, transportation, deposition. We've also got subaerial processes. So think about weathering and mass movement. Again, if you're expending landforms, the expectation would be that you'd be drawing on these processes here and you would be confident and comfortable using them. So again, just check, this goes back to GCSE, but that you're able to explain each of these processes you can see here. So those processes result in the formation of some of the landforms you can see here on the screen. Again, check, can you explain things like caves, arches, stacks and stumps? For those, I've done a separate video at GCSE level, but it will cover perfectly what you need to know there. Likewise for wave cut notches and platforms. I'll pop a link here to remind you. But again, just check, can you explain the formation of these? Thinking about features I would find at a beach. These are what we call minor landforms. But again, if you had a photograph in front of you, would you be able to identify the runnel like you can in this diagram here? Would you be able to identify the cusps? Okay, again, just check. Can you pick them out on a diagram? Do you know roughly what they are here? So I suppose the next thing to think about is that simple spit formation. If I've got a straight spit, it's going to go out roughly parallel to the coast, and that's what I would call a simple spit. I can also call this one here then a compound spit. Okay, so if I've got occasional changes in the dominant wind process, i.e. it's got this hooked or curved feature on it that you can see here, that's what I would call a compound spit. Again, just check, can you explain longshore drift and how longshore drift here would lead to us having a spit forming? A bar then is that ridge of sand and shingle which joins up two headlands, often cuts off a bay, behind which we are going to find a lagoon, hopefully. Just check, do you understand how perhaps a spit could turn into this bar? Mud flats found at the edges of permanently submerged marine zone. Again, they're susceptible to changes in sea level, wave action, volume of water in the river, and tidal flows. So, over time, these mud flats that you can see in the pictures here are going to develop into salt marshes. Again, if you're being asked to explain salt marshes in the exam, it might be wise to draw mud flats first. So, factors needed for your salt marsh to develop them you've got to have a sheltered shoreline. You need that river estuary, salt water, lots of fine sediment, and you're going to need two flows to meet, i.e. the flow of the river and where the flow of the sea meet. If I think about what's happening to my sea level, I've got two types here. I've got what we call eustatic and isostatic change. So eustatic sea level change is caused by volume of water in the sea or by a change in the shape of the ocean basin. Isostatic change is caused by vertical movements of the land relative to the sea. So if I think about why I've got this happening, well, reason one for eustatic change would be to think about the climate. If I've got an increase in temperature, it's going to cause melting of ice sheets, but also a decrease in temperature means I'm going to get more precipitation falling as snow. Think about how that's going to impact then on what we said eustatic change is. So it's obviously going to increase that volume of water. Again, tectonic uplift. If I've got the crust here and it's lifting up, it's going to increase the volume, isn't it? So C4 spreading may decrease sea level as well. If I think about isostatic change, so I'm thinking about vertical movements here. Perhaps the downward movement of land then causes sea level to rise locally, while uplift of land might cause sea level to fall. So perhaps think about the depression of the Earth's crust. Subsidence of land, tectonic processes. Again, each of those three here would impact on isostatic sea level change. We'd obviously be thinking about the local scale, won't we, there, if I'm bringing that back to the skills I need for my 20 marker. So that leads me on really nicely then to thinking about submergent and emergent coastlines. If I'm at a submergent coastline, I've got stretches along the coast that have been inundated okay, by the sea due to the rise in sea level. An emergent coastline then is a coast that's been exposed because of that fall in sea level. So with submergence and emergence, that brings around various different landforms. You can see I've put them here for you. But the main ones with submergence is thinking about rears and frauds. And emergence is thinking about raised beaches and marine platforms. 
So if I consider Rhea's first, this one here is just a land form that's referred to as the drowned river valley. So form when the valleys were previously at sea level become submerged. Again, if I think about an example here, Portsmouth and Pool Harbour would be examples of rears. The fjord then, I'm thinking about this glaciated carved U-shaped valley that's filled then by rising seawater levels. Your best example of a fjord would be Norway. Dalmatian coasts then are undergoing submergence. So these are where valleys lie parallel to the coast and are flooded by sea level. So I think Vancouver Island, Croatia, they're really good examples of these. Raised beaches then, so areas of sand or shingle and deposits that are found high above the tide. Think Hudson Bay here, that'd be your best example, that's what the picture's of. Marine platforms, so wave cut platforms can be raised and left higher than the current sea level. So Santa Cruz, California, you can see here is a great example. Relict cliffs, so these are cliffs above beaches that are no longer eroded by the sea and slowly get covered by vegetation. So the Isle of Arran in Scotland here would be a great example. So I suppose if we've got all of these landforms and we know we've got these marine processes and subaerial processes, we've got to consider coastal management. And coastal management really has two aims. The first of which is to provide defence against flooding. The second of which is trying to provide protection against coastal erosion. But I might also say, branching off of that, we want to try and stabilise these beaches that are affected by longshore drift. We want to try and protect these sand dune areas and salt marshes. We know these are huge hubs and havens for biodiversity. So we might see something called a shoreline management plan. So shoreline management plans are developed as part of the UK government's efforts to make coastal management more sustainable. We've got roughly 22 shoreline management plans that match up with the sediment cells. And again, they work on a variety of different scales. So this would be really useful here as part of your 20 markers to consider this. Again, if I'm thinking about the sort of options I've got open to me as part of a shoreline management plan, I've got four really. So I can hold the line and maintain those defences. I might do manage realignment, so it allows me to realign the shoreline backwards or forwards with management, so hopefully try and limit the movement. No active intervention, which basically means do nothing, or advance the line, so new defences are built further forward where existing defences are. To be honest, if you're going to do advance the line, you've got to have really secure funding and lots of it. So disadvantages then of using a shoreline management approach, again, to help with your 20 markers, very time consuming leads to unpopular decisions often of doing nothing, so can leave local people pretty angry. Sometimes it's quite difficult to educate him or sell to local people this idea of using them and protecting the area indefinitely may be economically unsustainable. It's gonna cost a lot of money. So I might choose to use something called integrated coastal zone management. So this is the one that came out of the UN Earth Summit in 1992. If I'm using this method here, I'm thinking about integrating it and viewing the environment as a whole. I might consider the different uses of the area. I might also think about the level of authority. So authority here works locally, regionally and nationally. They all have an input into this dynamic strategy. So if I think again about this one here, I might look at the area of Pevensey Bay and think, right, what actually is effective here? What do I need to protect? And so I suppose with the Pevensey strategy here, if we're really concerned about longshore drift, coastal flooding, coastal erosion. So really here they've got the challenge not to negatively impact on Hastings along the coastline, but also to protect Eastbourne to Hastings railway line. So you might consider the strategy here sort of threefold. The strategy at Pevensey Bay has got to try and affect people, the environment, but also the economy. So they've got to find a cost effective way of managing the coast. So would a seawalk here do it at about £45 million? Would that be enough? So if I think about the key players and the key people involved here, remember we talked about authority on a variety of scales, I might first consider the Pevensey Coastal Defence Limited, so the company here that's been providing most of the efforts so far. I might think about the Environment Agency, who's responsible for looking after the country's rivers and coastal regions and 15 million hectares of land. But I might also consider the views of DEFRA, 
and think about, well, is the government department responsible for these policies? Would they have an input here? Would they need an input here? And so here, this is what they're doing now currently at Pevensey Bay. So thinking about recharging, so shingle that's lost from the front each year is being replaced. Recycling, they've got bypassing, groins, beach surveys to try and identify weaknesses in this. So they're not just doing these methods, they're actively going back and reviewing them. So you're putting that much money in, you've got to be sure that what you're doing here is having an impact. And last but not least, then your final case study in Coast is thinking about the Sundarbans. So again, this is on the delta of the Ganges, one of the largest mangrove forests in the world. It's relatively flat and low-lying land. So these mangroves here are trees that have adapted to the salt water and the mudflats. You can see them here in this picture at the bottom. Climate change here is posing a massive threat to this forest. So rising sea level, as well as the establishment of industrial projects around this area. Agricultural activities have destroyed quite a large area of this land as well. And so it's left us with some huge risks, both natural and human. So I might say, right, the risks to the environment here are lots of cyclones, flooding, perhaps high levels of salinity in the soil, but that could be balanced by the risks to people. So the over-exploitation of coastal resources, for example, destructive fishing techniques, lack of awareness about the environment. So here, just to remind you, I might sort of take one of three approaches. I might sort of try and develop this resilience, so the ability to cope. I might think about mitigation and how I can reduce the severity of this hazard. Or I might talk about adaptation and think about how can I adjust these living conditions. So if I'm thinking really now about where I move forward from here, I suppose the big question I'm asking myself is trying to say, right, actually, what could we do in the Sundarbans to sort of try and develop each one of these? If I want to try and develop ability to cope here, I might try and give the local people some strategies about exactly what it is they can do moving forward. If I want to reduce the severity of the hazard, I might think about where these people live in proximity to the coast. And if I want to adjust the living conditions here to try and reduce that vulnerability, I might try and consider alternative employment for the local people. I might try and consider, again, the proximity of their house to the waterfront. I might try and think about what other industry is open to them or available to them that, again, would fit into each of these three here. So I suppose, again, the big point if you're taking anything away from this is, yes, make sure you can do all the AO1 that we've just talked through here, but constantly being having in your mind, how can you be critical about each of the ideas and each of the things that we've talked about? Because those are the skills the examiners are looking for you to show off in the summer exams. Best of luck.